Hello, Agnes. Hey, Robin. Today, we're going to talk about management. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we could make a special extra pay session of this that we could sell the business to to maybe make extra revenue. Because, you know, books on management, like, they, they just give you more talk revenue and more book revenue. So it's just, we, we, we could do that if we wanted, but probably not. <laughs> um, well, we should, we're presenting ourselves as giving advice to managers, right? Which everybody does, but all the managers do pretend that. Like, it's it's out, pretty unlikely we're going to end up, are we going to end up doing that? Anybody who talks about management is seen as giving advice somehow. So we will probably, we'll probably find that somehow. Okay, we have to assess this at the end. And okay, we will. Yes. We did. All right. All right. So I wanted to start with a provocation. Um, I think I recall reading about um, several centuries ago in Scotland, then maybe the local lord or an English lord had this right to have sex with every woman before they got married, like on the wedding night or something like that. And we look at that and we are just outraged, I think, in our culture. That just seems a terrible affront. And we have many such things with respect to the privileges that kings of old once had. That is, because we live in a democracy and we see ourselves as having these rights with respect to the government, we look at kings of old and leaders of old and the kinds of freedoms they had and discretion they had as uh, something, you know, you think, how could they respect themselves living in such a world? Uh, and we are proud to then live in the world we live in by contrast. And there's a sense in which, yes, they lived in that world with respect to their king, but mostly they didn't interact with their king much. And in the ancient world, most people in, you know, lived in relatively small organizations, a family business, perhaps, or a neighborhood or, you know, things like that. But we today in the last few centuries live in large organizations. We live in, um, firms of many people, schools of many people. And that's in some sense, the main thing that's happened in the last few centuries and the other ways we've gotten richer, more a consequence of these large organizations. And in these large organizations, we don't really quite realize just how much discretion the leaders have. That is, they really can do a lot of pretty arbitrary things. And, you know, their arbitrary judgments make huge, you know, impacts on what happens in firms and who rises and who falls, what projects happen or not. And perhaps if in the future we have more, you know, better organizations that have better processes, we will, they will look back on our world with a similar sort of horror that we look back on these ancient kings and their arbitrary powers. Uh, that's the provocation I start with is to ask, you know, how arbitrary are their powers and how much should we, or do we disapprove? Yeah. Um, so. Okay, we're going to talk, we're talking about management, but are we, I guess I, my understanding was that we were specifically going to talk about like corporate management or do you yeah. want to? Well, but okay. it's not that different in a wide range of other organizations, but oh. our, our more specific examples are corporation, but most organizations in the world that do most things are corporations. So. Well, okay. Um, uh, so because I, I, because I thought I would give a disclaimer, which is that Everything I think about this topic came from reading this book that you suggested to me called Moral Mazes, which is here. Well, if you're watching the video, you can see it. But if you're uh, listening, you can just know that I lifted the book up. And um, uh, and so an I was going to give an example for the book uh, of the discretion of the CEO. So 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 this guy, Jackal, who's a sociologist who um, kind of spends a bunch of time sort of observing a bunch of different firms. In one of them, he says that he was puzzled by how many nautical metaphors were being used for everything having to do with the firm, even though the product had nothing to do with that, and even though they were like landlocked somewhere. And it turned out that the CEO was really into sailing. <laughs> and so everything was described in nautical metaphors. Um, so that's just an example of discretion. And uh it, you know, that's going to seem less offensive to us than the king getting to sleep with all the women. Um, uh, so I, I like that one I find kind of funny, um, but not, maybe not super offensive. 
Um, I guess it's hard to assess which things would we find offensive if we were different from ourselves. Like, will they, will the future people think that that, uh, uh, so maybe there's two different questions. So one of them is like, will the future people look back and say about the, um, nautical thing that was horrible. It's evil that CEOs get to dictate that their all their employees use nautical metaphors. That's one question we get asked. So which things seem perfectly okay to us, but would seem bad uses of discretion um, uh, in the future? A totally different question we could, should ask. We could ask to which the example you gave about the king is sort of irrelevant. Is which things would we now think are unacceptable if we realized that CEOs were doing them or something? That is, presumably there's a lot of discretion whose use is covered up. Um, and it's going to be more potentially offensive than the nautical metaphors, right? Uh, there's going to be stuff that is we would now find, uh, in fact, offensive and unacceptable. Um, like there's stuff in Moral Mazes about how you can sleep with the secretary, but not with the secretary of anyone who's above you in the management chain. So if you're going to sleep with some secretary or other, you can't be like your boss and secretary. So maybe that that's the kind of similar to the King thing, right? Right. Um, it's not, but of course you don't have a right to sleep with the secretary. You got to seduce her or whatever. But the point is there are constraints on which secretaries you can sleep with, and those constraints are dictated by the management hierarchy. So that's kind of similar to the King case. Right. So we both read Moral Mazes recently, and it has a lot of very provocative examples. And I think the range of the examples just gives you a feeling of how much discretion these bosses have. So it seems like they have enormous discretion to simply promote and demote people and fire people. Uh, and that may be something more people react to emotionally. That is at these higher levels of management. T typically when a new person comes in at an organization, they just typically reorganize things and they, it's some, you know, they put their friends in and they take out the people who aren't their friends and, uh, they reorganize as excuses to do that. So that's certainly got to be perhaps objectionable for people. Uh, they talk a lot about sort of relatively arbitrary choices of sort of priorities. Like I think there's an example of a very profitable sub-business that the manager just doesn't want to be associated with because he just doesn't know how to talk about it. So he sells it on the cheap and, uh, you know, loses a lot of money for the firm because he just doesn't want to touch that. Um, you know, which you might think from the point of view of investors is pretty arbitrary choice and, um, you know, talking about how in organizations, basically, if you can get promoted fast enough, um, you can mismanage an organization by sort of, you know, investing less in maintenance and, uh, things that have long-term value and look good on the temporary, you know, um, expending sheet, like you saved money, whatever, but then you leave quickly and then uh, the the costs don't come back to you. They come to whoever takes your spot next. Yeah. So, you know, that seems problematic. So, so I mean, if you want to say it's problematic, I'm with you. Um, it, your, your description of people as having lots of discretion, that's pretty much the opposite of the conclusion I would have drawn from moral mazes. So, um, um, the thing that once going on moral mazes is that you actually rarely, the CEO rarely shows up as a character in the sense that I, I don't get the sense that he talked to many CEOs or that they gave him access. So he's mostly talking to like, you know, upper middle managers or something like that. Right. Uh, and so that's who we're talking about here. And maybe the CEO and the one who gets to set the nautical medical board, maybe the CEO really does have a bunch more discretion, but to get to be CEO, he had to go through these steps. And those are the people that we really meet in the in the book and i would describe their position as the opposite of discretion so um like in fact the feeling that i came away from moral mazes with was you know i've always thought oh capitalism it's the system i live in it's probably pretty okay and reading moral mazes i'm like capitalism is horrible oh um, all these people who hate capitalism like how do they even come to their hatred without reading this book because it's like this expose of the world of of the dark world of management and but what's dark about it is how it like twists and forces and contorts people into the shape they have to be in order to survive as managers. So like the example you gave, first of all, 
you know, that when somebody is in charge, they put their friends in charge and they fire people. They have to do that if they want to stay in charge. There's no option for them. The guy who who got rid of that profitable business because he didn't know how to talk about it. It's like, well, he's not going to survive. Uh, if okay. So I accept the discretion. I'm not talking okay. about me. Um, uh, the, um, the thing where you um, have to keep going, uh, like where you, where you have to keep the, the ground running under your feet at all times um, and just like do something to make a profit quickly and then move on to the next thing. Like that's something you're also forced to do. All of these are just constraints that are operating in the system. They're not constraints that maximize profit. They're constraints that seem to be there like almost like homegrown of their of their own accord to like twist people's souls into a horrible shape. Now you can talk. So I, I accept that discretion is the wrong word to use here and the wrong image to use. It's less about arbitrary use of power for arbitrary pleasures or whatever. And I might make a different analogy. Say, if you think of an old, say, old uh, Europe or China or something, think of a world of small village, you know, villages and towns with warlords who tax the towns heavily in order to pay for their fights with neighboring warlords. And, you know, a large fraction of the economy goes to pay for these lords who spend a lot of their effort fighting with other warlords. And it's not good for the society as a whole, but you can see how if you don't have a warlord, you're in trouble. Yeah. And it's hard to prevent some warlord ruling over your area and spending most of their money in fighting the others. And so that's more what this world looks like. This looks like the ultimate investors just are not in charge of this process. And it's, it's a battlefield where people are fighting and wasting a lot of resources in fighting. Uh, but yes, it's hard to know if you were in one of these organizations, how you could do otherwise, but to fight in the same way everybody else is fighting if you're going to stay in this game. Uh, but go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish what you're saying. Well, so we might think in, in the capitalist story is that, oh, but see here, there's an ultimate owner to the whole firm. And the ultimate owner will then discipline this process and not let these destructive wars happen on their territory. So certainly like that's the point of a king sometimes, right? In a world of warlords, the king is supposed to stop all these lords fighting each other. Maybe the king and their lords fight some other neighboring nations, etc. But at least the ancient stories of the empires were better places to live because internally this constant fighting was, was limited. And you might think that would be true also of capitalist firms and government agencies even that the higher level lord... <laughs> Uh, owner, ultimate owner, would control this and limit this. And the surprising fact is that, in fact, even if they presumably try, they, at least up until now, have relatively limited powers to uh, well this fierce fighting. So I think that the fighting is only one part of... Um, uh, one set of forces that shape this um, twisted social world. The other is, I mean, and maybe it's related to the fighting, but still it's the one that comes to the fore to me more. It's like there's this constant need to put on a knowledgeable front or a unified front or a be a team player. Um, like there has to be this sense um, there, there's this, a lot of effort that goes into producing the image that we know what we're doing. So like the company has to make a bunch of decisions. They're consequential decisions. And a lot of them seem to be based, the actual decisions seem to be based on, not on knowledge that this is the right thing to do. They're based on other things, but there is a lot of, the, the question is not, which is the best decision, but the question is, which decision can I most readily present to others and myself as being somehow the best decision? And so that force where like a certain appearance of control, I think it's that, it's a certain appearance of control has to be laboriously and expensively maintained. And I agree with you that a part of what goes into the importance of the maintenance of that is 
that we I have to be ready to fight and defend it against the you know other managers who want to take my place or whatever. There is that, but I think just fundamentally, there's also just this pressure to maintain um, the appearance of knowledge. So I think it is pretty similar. It has some differences, but um, fundamentally, uh, in both this modern corporation and in an ancient Lord manner, the Lord has to both stand ready to fight outsiders. They also have to sort of present themselves as Lord yeah. and as superior. And they have to have superior, you know, buildings and clothes and talking style. And they have to act knowledgeable and confident. So quite often, lords of matters were not very deferential to other experts under them about how decisions should be made. They preferred to show their confidence in making a lot of decisions themselves. And they also needed to do this not just to impress people under them, but to impress the other opponents who might fight them. That is... One of the ways to discourage someone from fighting you is to seem to be strong. And so one way to seem to be strong is to seem to be in fully of command internally and to seem to be dominant and in charge. And that's also true in the modern organization. That is, you have to be ready to fight if someone fights, but you also want to discourage fighting by showing your strength. And one way to show your strength is to show that you, you know, have lots of loyal people supporting you and that they accept your word as God and you, you know, are confident and people see you as confident and they're inspired by your confidence. And those are similar processes. Yeah. So and just as a, a, like a kind of aside, the reason why this book kind of blew my mind was I had this like naive narrative of in the olden days, there was feudalism. And that was bad because it was inefficient, among other reasons. And but then we got more like free markets and, you know, we got capitalism going and we got um, these big corporations. And with this book is like, yeah, and then we rediscovered feudalism. <laughs> and it's just inside the corporation and we never escaped. And it's like a horror movie of some kind or something. I'm like, wait a minute. It's just feudalism again happening inside these corporations. Um, that's just shocking. Uh, wh like, why, you know, why isn't that being shouted from the rooftops? Well, I, I will join you in shouting from the rooftops. <laughs> but like with many of my colleagues say as economists, uh, we want to admit that capitalism is in fact a lot worse than you might have thought it was, but then the alternatives are also a lot worse too. Right. That is, all these same sort of things happen in nonprofits, they happen in government agencies, and it may in fact end up being worse there. So one thing we tend to focus was that emphasize is to say there's this larger social process of selection that's basically killing some of these firms and making others grow. And that's selection of substantial part on whether they actually achieve their supposed ends. Uh, and so firms that find a way to sort of pay more attention to the actual experts and make better actual decisions, they are in fact winning over time, even if that's not center of attention at the people fighting these battles inside these firms. Like, and there's, um, that's empirically supported. Like it's been studied that, um, you can compare these firms based on how much, or, or is that just their, the economists are like, that better be true or our whole edifice collapses. No, no. So, so we, we can look specifically at the productivity of firms in term and at specific levels. We can look at management practices. We can look at you know, plant productivity, we can look at sales productivity, delivery productivity, and we can see that they vary substantially in productivity uh, by quite a lot. More economists were kind of surprised by how large productivity often varies and that the more productive ones are in fact growing and winning out over the less productive ones. And that's just a fact about the economy. And in some sense, the selection effect of, you know, having the unproductive ones die out and the more productive ones win is actually a stronger effect than productivity increasing within firms. That is, obviously firms are trying internally to look for better ways of doing things and replace better ways with worse ways, but that effect is real, but it's weaker than the effect of just uh, having the ones that aren't doing so well die out. So, um, Things that keep 
firms around for a long time, like um, that allow a firm to stick around for a long time, that might be um, bad overall. Like if there are measures or things that, you know, incentivize the stick, like it might, it's, it's, it's better if there's like a pretty good turnover that I would think, because the firm's not going to improve. So that's often the usual call for small business, the call for innovation, the call for, you know, not regulation to allow replacement of old with new. So sometimes what happens is old firms have a lot of political power and a lot of, say, workers who like there, and they try to use regulation to prevent their decline uh, to get, you know, direct government contracts and subsidies in order to, um, you know, slow their downfall. But like, why? Um, okay, like in the case of human, so human beings, I think there's there's value, there's social value to human being turnover. Um, like um, sometimes they say um, um, science progresses one funeral at a time, and it's a similar principle, right? People are very stuck in their old ways, so maybe it's valuable to science that human beings only live like whatever eighty years. Um, it would be wrong to murder them after. 80 years, like to make sure that we got the turnover, but it seems less obvious that that would be wrong in the case of firms. Like, what if we just, what if we had like a law that, or would that, you know, regulation the other way, regulation that would kill any firm after it gets a certain age? I mean, I'm not immediately opposed to it. I would just say that's the kind of proposal we could do an analysis of. We, we could, you know, fit a model that had the parameters of the data to that sort of a policy and try to figure out whether that was on that a good idea or not. Um, but that's, a, it's more far afield from our initial discussion here, at least, which is, you know, it's the contrast between there is this larger system by which slowly the world is getting more productive. But of course that was also true, presumably of Lords of the past. Right. So, I mean, Lords of the past who mismanaged their estate also on average, presumably lost relative to lords who didn't mismanage them as badly. And over time, better management of estate practices, you know, spread around. But, you know, in the past, sort of their ability to manage their military campaigns probably did actually matter more to their success or failure than their ability to manage, say, how farming or, you know, other sorts of production was done on their estate. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's maybe today, uh, we at least have less of the overt war in military. Most of these, see, you know, managers are dying, thankfully, in these battles. Uh, but uh, there's still a lot of waste. Yeah. You know, oh, I wanted to, like, a little bit challenge your claim about, like, why can't the CEO tamp down this these interior battles? Like, we should probably assume that they are doing so, right? That is, like... To some degree, you know, yes. There is an over... There is actually way less than there was in the feudal period. Like the CEO's doing a great job, but there's no no sword attacks inside of the business. There's, you know, probably very little murder of any kind. Um, and um, and the hostilities probably don't even emerge really very much. And to the extent that they do, they're confined in very, very specific ways. And probably to the extent that the CEO ever shows up and visits, you know, the plant or whatever, there's the one passage about how they always repaint it when the CEO comes, <laughs> even though it's some huge amount of money to repaint it. Um, it probably people do then, um, uh, like are being nice and stuff to each other. Right. But the, 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 this, the, 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 this, the corporation is huge. Right. So like the Lord, how many people is the Lord presiding over by contrast with how many people is the CEO presiding over? It may be that with even with the Lord, the you know the people at the very bottom are going to have some squabbles that the Lord can't control, right? So, and the CEO has just got this huge empire and probably is tamping down on a lot of internal rivalries and stuff. Uh, and probably it's a lot better than it would be if they were fulfilling the CEO role. I think you're right. Um, there's this example in moral bases of the accountant, and the story of this accountant was that the CEO in this firm was very knowledgeable of accounting and was paying close attention to accounting in many pretty low-level parts of the organization so that when you were an accountant or a low-level person in the organization presenting your accounting, you would expect the CEO to come in and question you on substantial detail, and that would prohibit you or limit your attempt to play accounting games because the CEO would be policing those. And you know, initially, the accountant thought, what an admirable CEO for 
of being so aggressive to make sure nobody's cheating on their accounting. And then the story ended up, well, the real reason, well, a reason was that the CEO had his own slush fund and he was going to make sure that um, he could use that slush fund to sort of, you know, smooth out the company's returns, which looks good to investors. And he was going to make sure that nobody, anybody who caught on to a slush fund would be silenced and cut out. And his looking at all the details was part of his strategy to make sure nobody called him on a slush fund. So simultaneously, you know, he's promoting his own corruption at the top level while preventing corruption at lower levels. And presumably that might be just a general pattern. Each person at their own level is trying to get away with much as they can, but people higher up are trying to limit what they can get away with. Right. And on top of it all, he gets to look admirable because he's like, I'm, I'm overseeing all the accounts. <laughs> then... And he's watching out for malfeasance down below. Right, right. Making sure people don't, you know, lie about their accounting. So, I mean, it seems like what we're encountering here is like the problem, like the problem of human beings or something like that, you know. Uh, so I, 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 I yesterday I had lunch with someone who was asking me to be on a um, kind of faculty board of a certain kind. And I was explaining to her, you know, that I felt that this was not going to be bringing out my strongest points because I'm not, I said to her, I'm not good at managing, um, like, uh, people like over the age of about like 25, um, that is, I can manage children and I can manage like undergraduates, but at a certain point, I found that at a certain point, people reach a level of cognitive complexity that's outside of like where I'm comfortable and I don't know what's going on with them. And especially if there's many of them in a room talking to each other, I don't know what's really happening in the con. There's some other conversation. There's some other secret conversation that I'm not privy to that's happening like below the surface. Right. And, 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 and the fun she had the funniest thing. She's like, Oh, you don't have to manage anyone. These are just going to be conversations. And I'm like, no, 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 that is it. It's, you do it so naturally. You don't even realize it, but that's you though in those conversations, everybody's managing everybody else. Um, and every contribution is is playing, um, you know, some kind of role in a game over and above the informational content that's being communicated. Um, so, like, I'm very aware of my own, like, managerial defects um, in these sorts of contexts and, um, uh, and that, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and it seems like what managers are good at, they're good at the opposite of the thing I'm good at. Like the, but what right. is that? Well, that was actually a subject I wanted to talk to you about in this podcast. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, I think in moral ways is he talks about how various kinds of priorities change as you rise up the management hierarchy. He talks about how details fall down to low levels and how credit comes up to higher levels and at higher levels are sort of vaguer uh, than at lower levels. And a thing I think I see is that, um, you know, in conversations, people are often having an agenda that is they're, they have a positions they're trying to push and they're or trying to organize what they say and the responses in order to push a predetermined conclusion that they have or a stance or their, their organization. And that's, that varies in conversations. And I think in many lowest level conversations and organizations, there's just people trying to sit down and figure something out together where it's less about pushing a predetermined conclusion and more just trying to find an answer that can work. And that happens less as you go up. So if you think of, I mean, maybe the phrase honest conversation is a little too overblown, but in a practical sense, if you and your TA are trying to work something out in teaching or two mechanics are trying to figure out how to fix the radiator or whatever, there's a sense in which the conversation is more of an inquiry, the sort of conversation you approve, where they don't have a predetermined conclusion and they are they're willing to say they're going to be specific and technical and they're going to change their mind when somebody presents evidence and they're going to admit their uncertainties. And when somebody makes a good point, they're going to acknowledge it. And then as you move up, 
conversations get more performative in the sense that um, you're more pushing a point of view or if you're going to be more honest about it, you're like being honest with somebody about how could we present our view better to those other people? What would be a good strategy or what's a good strategy for undermining our rivals and promoting our friends? And so to the extent they're having an honest conversation, it isn't about sort of the ground, you know, things the organization does. It's about these organizational strategies and even rhetorical strategies. And so I think I see people who are good at higher levels of organization, they just have this... It, immediate habit, they know how to switch into a mode and signal that mode there. I'm going to be loyal in this conversation. I'm going to, if you're the boss, I'm going to agree with whatever you say. And if we have a party line and we're together in a meeting with other people, I'm going to stick to the party line. They're just very attentive to loyalty and what it is we're supposed to be saying and what's our position. And they are less in the habit of just having an open, honest conversation where they say, let's figure out the truth here. I wouldn't, um, um, uh, I wouldn't, um, say that it's necessarily about agendas. That is the thing that I've noticed is that say you have like a bunch of people like show up to a, um, like a faculty meeting. Okay. So these are the kind of meetings I've been in a lot of, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm missing it. So maybe there is a bunch, there are a bunch of hidden agendas, but I would say it's more like there's a collection of personalities and each of those personalities, they're a bit, they're a bit moody. They're a bit variable and whether or not something is going to appeal to them depends a little bit on how it's presented. And, um, there's like, there's a kind of art to like presenting your proposal or whatever in such a way as to capture the um to make it appeal to the particular people that are in the room and the particular worries that they're going to be having in this in this context and um it, it, it's not exactly the same as I, the judge i agree with it but what you're describing is you know, assuming an agenda. That is, you're saying if you have a proposal that you're trying to push, you pay a lot of attention to how you phrase it to who and how you pitch it so that it will be most accepted. So I agree that at higher levels, there's a lot of style and art and a charisma and other sorts of social skills that can help you, you know, push whatever you're trying to push. But the fact that you are having a this thing you're pushing is a distinctive feature of those conversations. As opposed to, like, you just have a question you're trying to figure out together. Yeah, but you usually have something you're trying to push. Like, that is, you have some view that you think is correct, and you're arguing for it. That's your agenda. And if you get a good counter-argument, you would listen to it. But how is that different? Like, I, I rarely I rarely encounter you as simply asking an open question. That's not a mood that you're, like, uh, like... But I wasn't presenting myself as a model here. You were. You were saying this is the kind of open, honest conversation that we like. If we includes you, then I'm saying no. You have liking is different than exemplifying. Okay, fine. But I I wasn't. I wasn't saying I was a model of it. But I was yeah. saying there is this things we the kind we like to praise, the kind of conversation we like to, uh, you know, lift up as an example. But I, but I guess I, I, I that's what I think is not right. That that is the kind of conversation. So first of all, I'm not sure that I want to say, well, the, the, this management kind is like the evil kind and my kind is the good kind. Um, but um, 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 it, it seems to me that um, being good at this group conversation requires a kind of sensitivity to the psychologies of other people. Uh, and, it, and in particular, to the, to the new forms that those psychologies take when they're formed into a group. Um, that that skill is not a skill that I so much have. And I would bet, though I haven't observed you in such context, that it's not a skill you so much have. But I don't think it's so much a matter of does somebody have an agenda or not. I, I, I just think that's the wrong way to classify it. I think that in honest, open, intellectual conversations, there's often an agenda. Someone may say, here's what I want to explain to you. Here's what I want to convince you of. Um, in fact, it, there, I would say in honest, open, one-on-one -on -one intellectual conversations, the, 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 there's often most transparently an agenda. That is, the person is willing to be very explicit about their agenda. But, but you agree that Jackal presents the style of discussions and priorities as changing as you moved up the management hierarchy. 
he talks about people higher up remembering wistfully the old days when they were at a lower level and could focus on sort of concrete practical issues, uh, you know, about how to manage, do something in a plant, and that those <laughs> felt like more of a camaraderie, more of a alliance where they were working together on problems. And as they move higher up, they are being less technical, less specific, uh, committing themselves less to positions and paying more attention to alliances and uh, support and possible political retaliation. Those are things that happen as they moved up. And okay. So I had to tell you something was, which reminds me of in the book. Um, so your description of how the people at the bottom like have this kind of camaraderie and you know they're working together whereas like the people at the top are like nasty or whatever it reminds me of in the in there's an example in the book where um there are the managers who are actually managing the workers right so so this is at a company right. i think it's at a, a weaving company so they're managing the people who are operating the looms so the the workers are of a lower social class than the managers and the managers who manage them say um, like things that you might find offensive about them, like that they're, you know, stupid or boorish or whatever. Um, whereas slightly higher level managers romanticize them and the slightly higher level managers are like, oh, the like, um, you know, the kind of like naive joys of being a peasant or something. Right. So the way you're describing the lower level people sounds to me like how the higher level people describe the lower level people. Whereas the people who are actually close to those people um, have a more have a darker view of them. And also this was striking in Jacqueline, they're also nicer to them. That is like if they have to be fired, the people who actually have to do the firing feel terrible about it and think about how to present it and whatever. And the people who are romanticizing the high up who have decided that we have to have layoffs. They, they're they like, um, you know, they don't have to pay much attention to it. And um, they're like, oh, they'll find a job somewhere else. Whereas the person who's close knows how hard it will be for that person to find a job somewhere else. Anyway, I like, I, um, there there's a kind of romanticism that we can have of the people at the bottom that we're more likely to have if we're further away. From right. And, but it, that does seem to speak to that higher level people are more detached from reality, right? They are, they are paying lots of attention to the actual data and facts about that world and they are more in a world where they get to spin these different visions and it's the visions they spin that count at that higher level and the ground facts matter less i think they're just attached from, to a different reality so they are detached from the reality of what's going on on the production floor but they are very attached to the reality of knowing exactly what's going on and in, in the lives of all the other managers and they in a detailed way have a lot of facts and information about that that they're responding to all the time Right, but that's not in reality. Well, it's, it's less about the overall productivity of the firm. So, the workers don't know much about the overall productivity of the firm either. They might know about this loom and what what when it tends. Right, right. but I mean the the productivity of the firm is the sum total of all the little things that happen, and people lower in the organization at least know about particular things that are happening in particular places, and then higher people don't know about much about any of the particular things. They know about some high level statistics, which are easier to fudge. Sure. But like when you say at least, you seem to be suggesting, well, the lower level people are sort of closer to um, uh, like having something to do with the productivity of the firm than the higher level people are. And that's not obvious to me. And it's not obvious to me that their knowledge has more to do with the productivity of the firm than the higher level people's knowledge. Like the firm, the productivity of the firm requires two kinds of knowledge, apparently knowledge about how to operate a loom and then like knowledge about what what kind of golfing so-and-so likes to do. So if we think about the old, you know, lords of the manor and long ago in a feudal sort of world, uh, we can talk about, say, the efficiency of farming or the efficiency of fishing or logging that the people yeah. on the manor might do. And then we could talk about sort of overall allocation, how many farmers, how many fishers, how many loggers, you know, how much to borrow from somebody else for a crisis, et cetera. And then there are these fights they have, and we could talk about their effectiveness and efficiency in the fights. And if we're looking at the overall social system, we would say that if there's innovation in how to do the farming or how to do the fishing, then that will spread and that will make a more prosperous world here. But if there's an innovation in spears or something, 
that's just not going to make this world overall more efficient, even if it makes any one lord help win their battles. And so then a question about modern furs is, uh, we can see that if they better figure out how to fix the looms or uh, make the looms work better, then that will overall add to the efficiency of the firm. When we see that the people at the top, if they know more about the, you know, what somebody's wife issue is about a different rival, then they can use that as a way to like knock them down and take over their position. It's less clear that that's to the overall benefit of the firm. And so there's this open question. Surely some things higher level managers do are important for the overall effect of this firm, but then other things they do are more about their private gain in fighting. And then we're just left wondering whether efforts at the higher levels are in fact, you know, similarly directed toward overall productivity as opposed to winning fights. Right. So, but I still think that, like, as to whether the spear technology was um, economically productive, um, it, like, it might or might not be, right? So it would depend on what it replaced. Um, and it could be, for instance, that we develop modes of fighting each other that... Um, more allow the economic activity to continue. Sure. Say we only fight in the winter when nobody yeah. can be sowing crops anyway or something. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And and so if you if you sort of if you sort of say, look, we have to accept that in order for I mean the, the, what when I said um like the problem is human beings, um what I meant was it kind of seems like human beings just naturally organize themselves into these weird hierarchies, like the management thing, right? And th and that sort of like the more of them you get together, the more of this high, the more pressure there is toward this hierarchical structure where everyone's always wanting to move up in the structure, and that creates all kinds of like tensions and problems. And it's only uh, a system that somewhat resolves those tensions that will actually function as a unit. But it's going to be paying a lot of costs to be resolving those problems like all the time. Um, but but it's not clear that there was some other possibility where um, we get a whole bunch of people together, but we don't give them any way of organizing or something. That that's not like that's not a thing, right? Um, and so if we if we're thinking about technological improvements to like their you know knowing what so and so's wife's grievance against him is or something, right? Um, well. Um, maybe that somehow, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. We shouldn't just assume that any improvement in that, like the getting binoculars so you can spy on the guy's wife or whatever, we shouldn't just assume that any improvement in that space is going to be an improvement in efficiency. Um, it's also true that not every improvement in like making the looms work better will necessarily make the, um, the company more productive because it might create other problems. Like what if the loom works better, but it's louder and now there are OSHA regulations and the louder looms mean that they can only work a few hours a day, whatever. So everything that might seem like an improvement is could in the end not be one, but it could be one. Um, but certainly at the local level, you have better ways to judge whether a local improvement is an overall improvement exactly because its effects are mainly local. So you can see whether it has more dust or more sound or things like that. And so they do that at that local level. They are they are making those local trade-offs about each change, and they're looking at a whole bunch of impacts of it. But it does seem like it's more feasible to judge whether something's overall productivity gain at that local level. I mean, I I, I guess I think um, I thought that the point was that in fact often it's quite hard. Like if we. Um, you know, have to decide whether or not to renovate whatever. There's some battery or something, and we need to decide whether we try to patch up the battery or get a new battery. And, like, it's clear that if we just get a new battery, everything's going to work better. But is it clear that it's worth the cost? Um, like, I, mean, I mean, I think it can be clear, except for the fact that, you know, the manager, it's not clear how far the manager is willing to go to cut current you know, maintenance in order to play this milking game they're doing. But if you were just looking at some overall cost of money to the firm, it would be relatively clear, but uh, that's different than what that manager's priority is in milking that particular organization. 
Oh. Right. And so if you if you were just looking at like what's beneficial to the firm, forgetting that the firm needs to be managed by a large group of people who need to have some way of relating to each other then, right? But it does need to be, it seems like. So, so I'd like to uh, give two related examples here uh, to sort of press on sort of the this difference. So one issue is about information silos. So within a firm, uh, typically each manager of each organization holds to his chest information about his particular group mm -hmm. and other managers of other organizations often try to have spies or something at substantial cost to try to find out what's going on in other groups because by default they don't get to know mm -hmm. and there's a sense in which for the firm as a whole there's really not much excuse for not just letting everybody know everything that is the firm as a whole just doesn't get there isn't any substantial benefit of the firm as a whole for allowing people to have these information silos. But if you have a silo and you can hold that, protect the information, then that does give you political advantages in the firm in terms of your conflicts with other people. If you can see inside their firm and they can't see inside yours, then you can find things to criticize about what's happening there. They can't find things to criticize about you. So that seems like a more, you know, obvious just overall failure. <laughs> You could imagine maybe somebody at the top says, you know, we're just going to do this complete open. And for example, Ray Dalio's, I guess, uh, he has this set of books about how he has this open, transparent information organization. And, you know, this is an argument for at least, now he has some other kinds of transparency where you're allowed to criticize anything and that might be a different sort of thing. But basically, it seems like there's a relatively strong argument for this just information transparency. So that's one argument. And then the related argument is I my latest blog post was these quotes about prediction. Somebody's trying to do get people to do prediction markets, and all the quotes are basically of the form, sure, these things are more informative, but they don't let me control the narrative. Yeah. And I want to control the narrative. But you might say, is it really good for the firm as a whole to let one division manager control their narrative? Because that sounds a lot like the information silo. You're not letting people you know, see everything that's going on there. The prediction markets would let more people see what's going on and it's hard to believe that the firm wouldn't be better off if this information were shared and that the objective estimates of the prediction markets were revealed even if that doesn't let you control your narrative yeah so i mean the thing about controlling the narrative is the thing i was referring to when i was talking about how you have to put forward this image of knowledge um so a question that i had i mean you were saying there's no good reason why you would want to keep the information secret um it occurs to me like there are all kinds of contexts where we let people keep stuff secret, like a patent or whatever, right? And we're like, we're, we could say, well, we're one big society. No, the patents is the op I mean, patents are things. You, a condition of a patent is you have to reveal the information. You oh, right. can't be secret if it's a patent. It's, 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 it's not. It's, it's like a trade secret, right? So like McDonald's special sauce or something, right? Um. So so so. Um, um, you might say, why does McDonald's um, keep, you know, we're all one big society. Why does it keep its ingredients and its special sauce to be secret? And the answer is um, competition, right? Um, um, that is within a big society, we've decided that it's more efficient. The way we're going to organize is we're going to have McDonald's and we're going to have Burger King and they're all going to try to make stuff. And their incentives is going to be, you can make money off of it if you um, do a good job with it. So why not think this happens inside of a firm? that it's actually more efficient for the firm to be organized to some degree the way the whole society is with little competing units that are going to keep hold on their information and that's going to incentivize them our division is going to do really well and we're going to prove to the ceo that we're the best division or whatever i happened to just lecture on this yesterday in my law and econ class um so anyway we do have ways in which we let people keep secrets because we have particular stories about how that's a good social overall value. I just don't see how that story works for the information silos in a firm. But here's some concrete examples. Like when a mining company figures out where minerals are below the ground, they can approach a, a rancher or a farmer who owns that land and offer to buy it, pretending to be another rancher or farmer and not revealing they're a miner in order to get the advantage of their information about the value of the land. And in, as a society, that seems like a good deal because otherwise people won't go and bother to figure out where the minerals are. Uh, and 
their profit from doing that effort comes from the fact that the previous owner of the land does not get the full value of the land. They don't know how valuable it is and they're losing. And But this looks like the way we can pay for somebody to do this work. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Um, similarly, we could say in stocks, when you buy a stock, you have a reason for buying. The other person has a reason for selling. We don't make you each tell each other your reasons. Um, we you know, think there's value here in you trying to figure out which way the stock should go because then overall the stock is more accurate. And that allows us to uh, allocate resources to firms better. And so, you know, in those two cases, we think it looks like a good idea to let people keep secrets. Um, similarly, of course, your secret for your password, it looks like it would be good for your banking, your banking account to have a secret password so that other people can get your password and take your money out of your bank, right? So we have a bunch of specific reasons we can understand why certain kinds of secrets are a good idea. The question is, do we have specific reasons that make sense in the context of, you know, two close divisions in the same firm, like marketing and engineering and, uh, you know, distribution, et cetera. It's hard to see the rationales for why those secrets make sense there. Right. Um, so let's say, um, um, that there is, if you will grant me that there's some reason for within a firm to have subgroups that are closer to one another than they are to the main group, like little working groups and whatever, mar marketing versus, you know, right. um, where you, the firm will be more efficient if those people feel some connection to one another, um, then you know, you would have similar sorts of reasons for secrecy as you have like within a family or something like there's stuff that's private to our family. We're a group. Um, uh, and if I, you know, if you thought I would just, if you're part of my family and then everything you say inside the family, I just say out in the world, you're like, you don't feel as close to me. And then we can't work, each, work together as well. I mean, it seems like you're stretching for it. Like, and those aren't very concrete examples. So I could give you a concrete example of if, say, an engineering manager says to subordinates, we need to, you know, we need to make a plan here. Why don't you three, three different people go make separate plans and come and show me your proposals and I'll pick which one's the best. Okay. Now, in the process of them each making their separate plan, maybe you'd want to let the paths of privacy and not letting to see the other person's plan in progress while they're each making their own plan. But that would be a pretty specific circumstance where you would want secrecy that wouldn't be a general like let everybody keep everything secret which is the usual default no but that but that there so the example you just gave was a good example against my original framing but it was not ex a good example against the rationale that i just gave you so i'll give you like let's take like let's take like a faculty meeting okay um so um faculty meeting contents of faculty meeting is private um, um, by, by default, um, unless for some special reason we recorded it, whatever, right? And there's, that's an understanding among like me and my colleagues that stuff right. is meeting. We don't say to the Dean or to whatever. And it's like, what is the benefit of that? Well, yes. like my, so, suppose you say, look at my colleagues and I, we view each other as kind of like a family. We're like a team. Um, and sometimes it's us against the administration. Sometimes it's us against the other departments. Um, and by having us view one another as a team, you get certain good results, just in the same way that we think it's good for people to organize into families. Um, and just part of what it is for people to see other people as being on their team is that you tell them stuff that you don't tell other people, and they won't tell the stuff that you tell them to other people. And that's how teams work. It's not stretching. Like, it's a basic it, it seems to me like a basic You're just invoking an assumption that people will feel better if they have secrets without any actual productive process by which it actually makes the organization more productive. You're just like, people enjoy. We, we might as well just say, look, if people should have a slush fund, they can do anything they want with because that makes them feel good. So let's just do it, right? I, I mean, them feel good. what I said is that um, it's connected to being close to a group of people that you can say stuff to them that they don't say to other people. So that this is just part of what we mean by being close to a group of people. Why can't they just be close in other ways? Have lunch together, or, you know, 
what do they have to do? And 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 is it is it uh you know publicly accessible? Because you're not really having lunch together if there's a video camera watching your lunch and that's being broadcast everywhere. Like people might say, I don't even feel like I'm having lunch with him because our lunch is public. Uh, I, I, again, you're just you're just invoking this assumption, saying that people can't work together unless they've got secrets and therefore arbitrary secrets, therefore information silos, right? Why not just let them have a limited set of secrets and then they can feel close on those topics and then be open on all the rest? I think it's fair to say that the set of things that are secret is going to be limited. And I think that's true in all of these cases, in the firms, in the faculty meetings, in... Um... The claim is it's not limited enough. <laughs> Uh, well, so the question is just how limited should it be? That is, look, yes, what, that's the question. One question we can ask is why should there be any secrets? That's what I took you to be saying. Why should there be information silos? Now, maybe you're granting I refuted that as I've already agreed that passwords are a good idea and you have to have passwords in a firm. So, yes, each person in the firm who has their own computer account gets to have their own private password that they don't share with other people, right? That's a good idea. I agree. And they should even have their a unique face such that, you know, we could, if we have a camera, we could see which person they were. It's unique, and other people can't pretend to be their face. Have, have faces. You're very generous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and even like what, when, you know, if they get their pay money and some of it goes to retirement account, some of it goes to spending, maybe that should be private too. Nobody else needs to know how much of their money gets moved into their retirement accounts versus elsewhere, right? Because there doesn't seem to be much of a reason for the rest of the firm to know that. But most of these things we're talking about are reason things the rest of the firm has reasons to know. You know, what the engineering plans are, what the mar marketing plans are, how much they're spending, uh, you know, uh, what their costs are, what, what the, you know, which shipments are en route to where, uh, what materials are ready for factory, you know, there's just all these details, most of which are relevant to the rest of the organization. And those are the things that tend to have information silos. Right. So like, say we're in a, you know, meeting about whether or not to replace the battery of some big thing. Right. And, right. um, and, um, and suppose it's looking like we are going to replace the battery. Um, and I have a worry about that. And I don't think that the worry should necessarily show up. Like, I don't want it to threaten the decision, but I might think it still should be raised because like it could be sort of important later or whatever. And so I want our group to be able to make a recommendation, let's replace the battery. But I want to be able to say, um, yeah, but the problem that we have with this battery is going to show up again with the next battery. Uh, and so like, let's keep something in mind or whatever. So, you know, why, why is it so hard to believe that um, the sort of the demands on the recommendation that we're going to make to the CEO um, and the informational demands um, within the group could come apart. It seems like you're just making an abstract possibility argument. I'm trying to focus on like concrete examples. Well, it was a concrete example. I you're just saying... But you didn't say why we should keep this battery information secret. You just said, what if somebody wants to keep the battery information secret, but not saying why? Right. But I, I, I so I meant to be saying why. Um, what, um, 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 I meant to suggest that if I raise this um, consideration, which is that in 10 years, this one's going to fail the same way that the previous one failed, then the CEO might take that as an indication that our department doesn't really think it should be replaced and thus not replace it. And that would be the wrong decision. So even though there's a reason not to replace it, I think it should be replaced. And I don't want to risk that decision being made. That's the reason why I don't want to reveal this. So it sounds like what you're saying is that um, when you make a recommendation uh, based on some details, often your recommendation I mean, the decision had multiple factors that went different directions, and you made an overall judgment about the overall weight of the factors. And then you want to hide those factors in order to make the decision seem more sure 
and it really is in order to prevent other people from making the wrong decision about him. That seems exactly the case where we would want you to be honest about that. It seems to me that it's better for the firm if everybody is honest about those sorts of considerations that weigh against the recommendation. That would allow other people to rebut, say, uh, bad decisions. If you're making a bad decision here, the way other people could criticize that is by pointing to the other factors that you are that you sort of decided didn't weigh up to enough and preventing other people from knowing about things prevents them from having that conversation where they try to critique your decision. So I think it's one thing the CEO could ask us, tell me what all the considerations are for and against replacing the battery. And then our group could just give him that set of considerations. That's one thing he could ask of us. Another thing he could ask of us is, should I replace the battery? That's a different question. And um, you might think like that what you're doing is saying, no, well, we should do both at the same time. That is, you should give your judgment, but then you should also give the reasons that would allow somebody to undermine the judgment that you just gave. And I guess I think that that's like, in a way, like all, at all these points in the organization, there are these like moments of control and here's what we should do. And they're always based on like insufficient information. I mean, that is information. You never have right. right. But someone at some point has got to say, this is what we should do. And maybe it's going to be the CEO, or maybe it's going to go all the way up to the CEO, but at some point it has to stop somewhere. And I thought we were imagining that it's going to, like, that our group was being asked to actually give a recommendation. Um, and then are we also supposed to provide the the arguments that would allow you to contravene it? Maybe. So, um, you know, the status quo today is that each organization has relatively little access to the data inside of the organization. Uh, they each organization is responsible for giving some data to everybody, but it's limited, and they keep a lot of secrets inside the organization. The alternative proposed is that we, as a default, just have a lot more of the information available for anyone in the firm to browse. Not that we you have to go out of your way to make a presentation on it, but that it's there for someone to go look at if they want, but they would have to take the effort to go do so. And We'll, of course, allow some particular privacy, like no videos in the bathroom, and you can keep your computer password, and you can Face. specify where your retirement counts goes. But that for most information in the organization that would seem relevant to the organization's overall productivity and activities, that that would be available to all, say, managers above a certain level in the firm. Um, that's the proposal we're trying to entertain here so that um, everybody can see all the relevant details that they might want to make whatever arguments they want to make on. So the question is, why not do that instead? I think this is going to have to be a to be continued because I have to stop now. Okay. Well, then it's been nice talking about management.